Today we're going to talk about how to determine the cut and bend parameters for a new type of sheet metal. We're going to finish up the monitor mount for the plasma table, and you'll get a chance to laugh at my welding skills. There's something for everyone. Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. Last week we started work on a monitor mount for the plasma table here and this stump of tubing sticking up is as far as we got. We're going to go ahead and finish that up this week. We need to miter the top of this and weld on another section of tubing and we need to make a 100 millimeter square VESA monitor mount to actually screw the monitor itself to. Now the design that I have in mind for the monitor mount is probably more complicated than it really needs to be but I want it to be as rigid as I can possibly make it. I don't want it to twist and flex as I'm using the monitor. The material we're going to use is 16 gauge mild steel sheet and that's something that I have not yet worked with so we'll need to figure out the cutting parameters and the bend parameters uh, so it'll be a little bit of a learning experience but with any luck we'll get the bends to land where they need to be and we'll get a usable part out of the exercise. This is Fusion 360, and this is the design for the monitor mount that we looked at last time. Down here we have the leg of the table, we have the 3D printed plug we made in the last video, we have a mast that comes up, an angled piece of square tubing here, and we have the VESA monitor mount that we're going to work on today. Now I have this modeled in 16 gauge steel with uh, three or four bends in it, I guess four, to try to give it as much rigidity as possible. The idea is that if I weld it here and here and on the back here and here, it should be very rigid to twisting forces from pressing on the outside edges of the touchscreen monitor. At least that's the plan. So let's uh, talk about how this thing is modeled. And to do that, I have a separate model here with everything except that. Now this is a multi-component design. So I've got the leg, the upright, the uh, 3D printed plug, and the angled uh, tube here at the top all as separate components. And I want to model the uh, vase amount as a separate component as well. Now in Fusion, if you want to have multiple sheet metal parts in the same design, and you want them each to have flat patterns, they have to be in their own components. So I'm going to come up here to create and I'm going to say new component and it wants the type of component. I will say that it's going to be a sheet metal component and I'm going to give it a name. This will be the, the vase amount and I'm going to pick a rule for the sheet metal and I'm just going to pick the steel inch rule. And you can see that has now created a new component and it has activated it. First thing I'm going to do is modify the sheet metal rules and this is not 10 thou thick. This is 16 gauge, so it's what, about 0 .5, 0 0.057 thickness. And then the default bend condition, bend radius is the thickness. I know that with the thinner metal, this needed to be thickness times two, but for this, I'm just gonna leave this alone. We'll start with that as the default, and then we'll tune it from there and see what we get. Okay, to model this, I'm gonna start with a sketch on the bottom side of the tube. So I'll right click there, say create sketch. And in this sketch, I'm gonna, bleh, moving this around a little bit too much. Okay, I'm gonna start with a line and I'm gonna hit X for construction and I'm just gonna put a line down the center of the tube. Then I'm going to start with a center rectangle and we'll just click here. I don't want that to be construction and we'll just drop it. Now the overall monitor mount needs to have a grid of holes on 100 millimeter centers and I'd like 10 millimeters of extra material around the outside so we'll make the overall monitor mount 120 millimeters. So I'll hit D, set the width of this to 120 millimeters. This is an inch design so I'll be saying millimeters and it'll be converting. And I'd like the center part of this, if we look at this design, I would like to have a 20 millimeter wide flat so that this hole is 10 millimeters away from the bend and from each of the edges. So I will make this center part, D for dimension here, 80 millimeters. And then I want it to be 20 millimeters off the top, so I'll just drop another dimension here. 
So that gets the location of our base flange in the right place. I will just click and control click to, to select the entire region here. And I'll come up here to the sheet metal tools and say flange and make sure that's on the correct side. And it is. Okay, so now I've got my base flange and this should be, if we inspect this, 80 millimeters wide. And it is, it's 80 millimeters. Okay, now let's put in the bends. So I will select this edge, control click, select that edge, select flange, and I will pull those up. Now I want those set, the bend position to inside. So it will be 80 millimeters to the outside portions. I want the bend on the inside of my 80 millimeter uh, piece there. And then I wanna come up the thickness of the tubing and I want the height based on the interfaces. So it will take the height off of this interface up to here. I know this tubing is one inch, and so I'm gonna go ahead and set this to 1.005. I'll give myself an extra five thou. I don't know if that's gonna be enough. We'll just have to play with it. And so if I click OK, now we have that flange, and if I inspect this, this top surface here should be five thou up from the top surface of the tube, which is exactly what I want. Okay, and so now let's put the return bends on it. So click there and control click here and add another flange. And these are going to pull out 20 millimeters. And I want the bend position to be located outside so that it'll end up on the top of the tube because remember we brought that edge up to just above the tube and that's where I'd like this inner surface and then the height datum should be from the interfaces because we know it was 80 millimeters width to here and we want it to be 120 so we'll pull out 20 on each side and this should give us the basic shape of our part now we're going to need to cut some holes to go around the tube and I'd like to cut those so that they are the, uh, just I just wanna take off the bend. And so I'll right click here, say create sketch, and I will project some lines, hit P. And I'm going to project this line here, and this line here, and then here and here. That'll give us the outside dimensions of our bend. Now hit P for project again, and I'm going to project the outside surfaces of the tube, but I want those to be construction lines because I want to add a little bit of clearance. So I should have dotted construction lines there, and I do. I'm gonna select that construction line and hit O for offset, and I want to offset that out at eh, 10 thou. And that will give me the outside edge there. I'll just do the same thing over here on this side. Offset, it'll be minus 010. Finish sketch, and that will give me some regions I can use to cut. So I can click here, control click here, right click, say extrude, and I will just extrude that straight down through, make sure the object to cut is just my VESA monitor mount. And that will then cut out those regions and make space for the tube. And I should have 10 thou clearance on the sides and those top and bottom inside faces should have about five thou of extra clearance. Okay, uh, that's the base shape of the thing. Let's put in the holes, right click, create sketch. And I'm going to throw in some more construction lines and I will bring a center line down here. I will bring a diagonal line across each direction. Actually, before I do this, because I um, just clicked this surface for the sketch, this surface down here is not actually included, so I can't pick up those edges. But if I say P for project, I'll go ahead and make sure those are construction lines. I'll just project that. And now we'll have uh, data points we can use. So now line, and I should be able to snap to these corners. Great. Okay, now I'm gonna put in some points. So create point, and I'll just put one right here on this line. Now I'll mirror that point around this line, and now I will mirror 
click and control click both of those. I will mirror those. Actually, it's do one at a time. Click this one, mirror that around this diagonal line, and that'll put a point down here. And then I will click this and mirror that around this diagonal line. So now we have our points, but they are not fixed in space. But if I just hit D for dimension, go between these and say 100 millimeters, now we have a 100 millimeter grid of points. I can finish sketch. I can come in here and say I want to create a hole. And I'll just click all of these. And the diameter of this, it's an M4 screw, and I'm gonna go ahead and make, you know, the VESA 100 um, spec specifies a four millimeter screw, so I'm gonna go ahead and make this five millimeters, just so that we have plenty of clearance for the screws. Now I'll come in here, hit F for fillet, and let's just round these corners off. And I'm just clicking all of those vertical edges. And let's say we want a radius of 10 millimeters. So that'll put that radius centered around that hole so it will look nice. And that is the part we need to make. So while we are still in this model or in this component, I will go ahead and click to create a flat pattern select the surface we want to stay stationary, and now we have a flat pattern. And you can see that this flat pattern was actually, um, well, actually you can't see it here, but if I finish the flat pattern and come back, you can look at this vase amount and you see that the flat pattern is inside here. So if you have multiple sheet metal components, you can uh, actually have these multiple components and each one can have a flat pattern. So we'll do the, the normal thing that you've seen me do in previous videos. We'll uh, go ahead and use the flat pattern to create the G-code to cut this out on the plasma table. I'll throw a link up here to a video that shows how to do that. And uh, we'll get this set up to cut out. So I'll also generate a drawing so I have dimensions for where to score these bend lines. And we'll take this out to the plasma table and cut it out. But before I actually go out and cut this part out on the plasma table, I want to make sure that I have my cut and bend parameters correct because this needs to be the right size so it'll fit around the tubing and the bends need to land in the right place again so it will fit around the tubing. So I have a standard part I use for testing a new material and this is just my little 3 by one bent coupon. It's actually 2 by one So if we look at this, this is from end to end on the outside 2 inches and from the top to bottom on the outside is one inch. So I use this as a test part that I can cut out, first of all, to make sure that I'm cutting the dimensions correctly, and then second, to make sure I have the bend allowance right. So I'll go in here and look at the sheet metal rules I'm using, edit this. Uh, this was last used on 20 gauge, so I'll set this to 057, and bend conditions, I'm gonna guess that just the thickness will be appropriate. Now we have that model. I'll right click on the flat pattern and say update, and then we'll activate it. And then this is the flat pattern. I will cut one of these out, and then we will score it at this distance, which is uh, 0.95 inches, fold it up and see how close we get to the dimensions. And if the dimensions are wrong, then we will come back in, make adjustments and keep testing on this part until we get it right. So let's go cut one of these out, bend it up, and see how close we get and make any adjustments before we make the real part. Okay, I've got the torch loaded up with the fine consumables and the same settings I was using on the 20 gauge with maybe just a little bit longer pierce. Let's uh, give it a shot here, cut out a test coupon and see what we get. And it doesn't look like that got severed. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to slow it down. That was cutting 300 inches a minute. I'm gonna slow it down to 150 and we'll give it another shot. Looks like the pierce was okay though. Okay, I just reposted it and moved my zero over and we'll try this again at 150 inches per minute. See if that works a little bit better.
Well, it definitely severed at that time. There's a lot of dross on the back, a lot more than I was getting with the thinner metal. Let's see how we did on dimensions. And it looks like there's 988. Try to get this. It's, it's, there's a little bit of dross on this thing, so it's a little bit hard to measure. And if I get kind of in between, we're looking about 992, 987, 988, 989. So we're about 10 thou under. So I probably should go back and uh, adjust, the, uh, adjust the width of the cut. And since we're a little bit undersize, we want it to move out. So it's actually doing that because it's cutting wider than what I actually put in as the amount. So I will go ahead and increase the width of the kerf by about five thou, and that should add about 10 thou to the width of the part. And I'll play around with some different speeds and just see if I can come up with something that doesn't put as much dross. And then once I get that sorted out, then we'll go and try to cut the real part. I ended up cutting a bunch of parts here for testing. This is the original one that I did at 150 inches a minute, and it's got a fair bit of dross on the back that didn't come off easily on the Scotch-Brite wheel. So I tried one at 200, and it actually was a lot better, cleaned up a lot nicer. Tried one at 100, and it was much worse, a lot more dross on it. Uh, so I settled on the 200 and then did some more testing, and it turns out 200 doesn't always sever. And so it wasn't always going through the sheet metal. So I settled on going back to 150 inches a minute, settling for the extra dross and just doing a little bit of extra cleanup. I'm just cleaning up the dross using a right angle die grinder and a two inch roll lock flap disc. And that makes short work of knocking it off and then smooth the edges on the Scotch Bright wheel. So I did one more at 150 inches a minute. This is with the default kerf that I had set up of 022 and cleaned it up nice and clean, and we can look at the dimension that we got from that. So I'm measuring 988 thou, if I measure right there. Down here, it's 991. There's 989 and a half. So depending on just how I cleaned it up, it's pretty close to 10 thou undersize. And what that means is that the kerf is cutting wider than 022. And I think I said earlier that if we're 10 thou undersize, it means we need to take 5 thou off of the kerf or add 5 thou to the kerf, but actually we need to add 5 thou to each side of the kerf. So if this is 10 thou undersize, we need to tell the software that the kerf is wider by 10 thou. So I cut another one telling it that the kerf was 032 at the same 150 inches a minute. And now we're getting this right there, I'm measuring one inch, two thou. Here I'm measuring half a thou under an inch. Here I'm measuring half a thou over an inch. So we're pretty much right on now on uh, with this part. So setting it up for a kerf width of 032 and 150 inches a minute is getting me results that I can live with that are very, very close. Now we need to calibrate the bend parameters for this. So I had this set up so that um, I, with the bend parameters that I have in on the part right now, which is I believe the bend set to the, radi the radius, same as the thickness of the piece, it calculates that if I wanna bend up the one inch tab, the score line needs to be at 950. So we'll go ahead and make a score at 950. We'll bend it and we'll see what we get. There's a score line at 950. Let's go over to the brake and put a 90 degree bend in it and then come back here and measure and see what we came up with. And because we've got a fairly small piece of metal, I'll just throw another chunk in the back here as packing. Set that up nice and square and right on the line. And let's see what we get. I'm gonna pull this to 92 on the gauge. And uh, let's go measure and see what dimensions we came up with. The easiest way to do this is with the height gauge. So this should be exactly one inch. 
and it looks like we are 17 thou long. And this should be exactly two inches. And we are six thou under, which means we have the bend in the wrong place and the bend allowance is incorrect. So I'll just make a note of this. 1.994 and 1.017. And we will go into the computer and make some adjustments to try to get that to come out. Now the bend placement being in the wrong place is because of where I actually placed the uh, bend line. So because I held on to this point and this one was too long, it means I had the line too close to the jaw. So I need to, uh, next time I clamp, I need to clamp it just a little bit further away. Okay, as we determined from our measurements, our flat pattern was too long. So we can look at what the flat pattern actually is by just bringing it up here and measuring it's 2.901 inches. Now that's actually too long because the sum of the two sides was too great. So we'll come back to this in a minute. Let's look at how far off we are. So the short side was one, was 17 thou long. The long side was six thou short, 1994. The total of those was 3011. What we really wanted was three inches. That's the sum of the two sides in the model, which means that it's 11 thou too long. So if the original flat pattern was 2901, we subtract that 11 from it, what we really want is a flat pattern that's 2,890. So what are we going to do to get the flat pattern down to 2,890? Well, the issue is probably the bend radius. So let me exit the flat pattern here. Let's go in and look at the sheet metal rules. Click here to modify those and we'll edit. Bend radius right now is the thickness. So that is 057. Let's try increasing that and take that to 0.067. We'll just make it a little bit larger. Now we'll come up here and we will update the flat pattern and then go and look at it. Now let's take our measurement. And we now have a measurement of 2897. And what did we want? 28. 90. So we need to go a little bit further. Let's just do the same thing. And we could probably do this with some calculations, but it's just as easy to go in here with trial and error. Okay, there we go. Now we've got a length of 2.89 and that's what we want, 2.89. And let's see where we ended up on the flat pattern or on the uh, sheet metal rules. We ended up with a bend radius of 083. So let me write that down. Let me update the other model. So we're dealing with a bend radius of 083, we've determined now, and kerf width of 032. Let me go ahead and update the tool and the bend parameters in the model for the uh, VESA monitor mount, and we'll cut one of those out, and we should be right on, if I can put it in the sheet metal brake in the right position. Okay, I think that's it. I think we've got our dimensions determined and tuned. We got our bends tuned, and I think we're ready to cut out the real part. Let's go. Good, those holes are 100 millimeters apart. That means I didn't screw everything up. Get the 
part all cleaned up and I've got my diagram that shows me where the bins need to be. So let me score those. And those bins do land on both sides inside of these holes. And I did check and the holes do fit the tube. So hopefully when we bend it, it'll still fit. Now because of the way these bins are gonna fit, this bar is actually too wide to go between them. So I need to get the narrower bending bar. This bar came with the brake, but hasn't been out of the packaging yet, so it's still covered in oil. This bar is narrower and it should fit better. Start with the same packing block and we'll start by bending up one of these ends. Okay. Then we'll flip it over the other way and do the return bend. Unfortunately, this bar is gonna be in my way, so I need to take that off. Okay. Clamp it and bend. Now the real question is, will the tube fit through there? And the answer is yes, it will. Oh, I landed those very nicely. Let me bend the one on the other side. And then the only other question is whether these holes are gonna be 100 millimeters apart. Instead of banging up my knuckles, I'll use a piece of copper here. That is the mount. Oh, and that's gonna be nice and solid. And that is gonna go right through there. Got a slightly larger gap on this side than what I had planned for, but I think that is gonna work just fine. It's a weldment after all, so I can easily weld across that tiny gap. Okay, for the mast, I'm gonna cut a couple of pieces of this uh, one inch square tubing. First one's nine inches and it's not a real fussy measurement, so this will be close enough. Easiest way to cut this stuff to length, especially when you need to miter it, is the uh, Evolution Cold Cut Saw. I love this thing. You definitely want hearing protection and invest in a shop vac or a broom because it makes a mess. Got the fence set to 15 degrees so I can just make the miter cut. Just like that. And then Set it back to square and make the cut on the other end. Okay. 
Got the upright piece here in the mill and I'm gonna go ahead and put the holes in it and just find the center and the end of it with the edge finder. Then use the DRO to drive to the right dimensions. And I've got to stop here so that when I rotate it, I can keep it in the same position. And there we are, there are the holes. Now we just need to weld it together. Here are some of the things that I'm good at. Analytical thinking. I'm an engineer so this comes naturally, or rather this comes naturally so I'm an engineer. Learning new things, I can absorb a lot of new information very quickly, and I'm told I have reasonable communication skills. Here are a few things that I'm bad at. Consistently setting aside time to practice things, and welding. Those last two are related. So while I'm presenting this welding montage for your entertainment, if you came here to learn how to weld, you took a wrong turn somewhere. Check out Justin over at the Fabrication Series on YouTube if that's what you're interested in. Okay, so we've got the monitor mount welded. And some of the welds turned out great. The autogenous welds on the sides of the miter, they were tight. And so the uh, autogenous welds there worked really, really well. On the outside, it was okay, had to add some filler. I added some filler rod to the inside and yeah, I'm not super happy with the result, but it'll hold the monitor on. Now, the welds with the sheet metal parts are another story. It's, you know, okay, I tried to do it autogenously, I tried to do it with lay wire, and you know, I was just having a little bit of trouble controlling the relative heat between the tube and the sheet metal, which is only slightly thinner. But I've got some welds laid in there and they're gonna hold. I'm not sure I would want these as structural welds if I was gonna be, uh, you know, building an airplane and flying in it, but uh, for holding up a monitor, they'll be fine. Now I probably also should paint this so that it won't rust, but nothing really rusts in the shop here with the exception of the slats in the plasma table. I will at some point tear this down, but I don't have time to do this now, so I'm gonna go ahead and put it together. And unless I see spots of rust showing up on it, it might never get painted. Anyway, let's take out the temporary post we put in last week and mount the new one. There we go. And the mount is way up here. Now let's uh, put the monitor on this. <laughs> I like that. Now I've got a computer to mount back here as well. And I went ahead and just drilled and tapped a couple of holes in here for the for screws to hold it. And that is that. Now I just need to hook some wires up to this and uh, we can power it up and see how it works. And there it is. This monitor is really quite rigid, probably the most rigid monitor that I have anywhere. And uh, let's go 50 inches a minute and... Now we can speed that up. You can see I have clearance right here. I did actually check that. Got about three quarters of an inch and obviously I got some wires here that need to be tended to and I'll wrap those down nice and neatly. I'll get a plug strip underneath here and I've already got some cable trays to route stuff around and uh, maybe that'll be visible in a future video. But for now, this is all I've got time for today and I'm actually really quite happy with this. And then as we wheel this around, the monitor goes with it. So this will tuck back in the corner when I put this away to store. And I think the only thing I'd like to have now is a dust cover to go over this monitor when I'm not using it. Anybody up for a sewing project next time? We'll see. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.